Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. I'm delighted to have you join me today. I'm finishing off a study on the Beatitudes, and we're going to look at Beatitude number eight and nine. Well, as a matter of fact, there's some disagreement as to whether or not there are eight or nine Beatitudes, but really it's not that important because the last two Beatitudes speak about the same thing. So I'm reading Matthew 5, verses 10 to 12. Listen to these wonderful words of Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I've noticed something about the Sermon on the Mount, and you have as well. The Sermon on the Mount turns the world of expectations up on its head. So if you ask people in this world, I mean, who is favored? I mean, who is advantaged? Who is in the best position possible? I think we're going to basically all agree that it has to do with people who have financial resources, money, uh, people who have power, political clout, and the ability to make a difference, uh, people who are attractive, people who have status, uh, people who have fame, people who have the respect of the watching world. Those people are advantaged and are in the most favored position imaginable. So it's basically the list of the who's who in the world. It's the intellectual giants. It's the movers and the shakers. And it's the individuals who discover new things and are able to implement those discoveries and change the world after their own will. See, these people are advantaged. And I think most people would agree, yep, yeah, that indeed is the blessed people. But Jesus turns it upside down. You heard him say, blessed are the poor in spirit. I mean, blessed are those who already have come to the conclusion that their own spiritual condition before God is impoverished. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, even while they may not have the levers of power to make any changes. Hungering and thirsting after it is enough for you to receive the blessing of God. So, you know, you can hear the words of Jesus and the expectations of our culture are so different from one another. And so we've got to ask ourselves the question, I mean, who's right? And of course, you're going to hear me say, uh, Jesus is right. And I'm going to say that for a number of reasons. But I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I mean, who would now admire the person who bought first class tickets on the Titanic? and who got the trip of a lifetime. I mean, knowing what we now know was the end of the matter, we're not going to say, well, that guy had it made. Now, we're not going to say that. Uh, but let me ask you this question. Who would admire the person now who was elevated, promoted in the final days of the Third Reich? Who would admire that person? No one. Who would admire the person who bought up all the Confederate currency they could? Now, nobody. Who would admire the person who poured all their money into the pre-stock market crash of 1929? If they did it all in 1928 and poured every last resource they had, believing it was all going to go up, who would admire that person? And the answer is, of course, we wouldn't. It were, these were the mistakes of a lifetime, having invested into something that was going to fail, collapse, and be a disgrace. We now would never admire that kind of a thing. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, the kingdom of heaven has begun. And the fact that it's already begun, you know, the blind see, the lame walk, those have leprosy are cured. The good news is preached to the poor. The dead are raised. All of these things have begun to happen so that the, the age of the kingdom has already become known in this present age. I mean, it may be small. It may seem insignificant to a great many. I mean, it may seem like an insignificant movement, but the end of death has already arrived. One man, Jesus, already stepped from his own tomb and announced that he had the authority of life and death in his hands. He announced that this is the new age, and the age that we've all become comfortable with is destined to collapse. So in the end of the day, the person who invests everything he or she has into this world 
is the person who's making the fatal mistake. You should never admire a person who's got it made in the present age because the present age is collapsing. Now, in the immediate, however, in the immediate, that is, as we see things now, it appears to us like this age is going to go on forever. And if you listen to John 15, verse 20, you'll listen to Jesus say, remember the word that I have said to you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So in other words, in the present day, it may seem that those who are blessed, and if the persecuted are blessed, you might wonder how can that be, but you've already heard what I've said. Jesus knows that the present day is coming to an end, but in the meantime, in the experience that we now have, it does seem like the followers of Jesus are at the lower end of the totem pole, but the time will come when the fortunes of the world will be reversed. So we want to remember this. You know, uh, there is in our day, and I've mentioned this on a number of occasions when I teach, that there is a false theology that goes about, and it's called the word faith message. And it's the idea that if you claim riches or if you claim good health, if you claim those two commodities in faith, you're promised that you're going to have them in this world. And uh, I, I'm always very eager to say, Jesus said the exact opposite. Um, so you, you need to recognize that if Jesus said, you're going to be treated like me, you need to understand that the way in which Jesus was treated was indeed very poor. Jesus was not known for being wealthy beyond all belief, but rather he was known for being a poor man. So as a matter of fact, in this present age, uh, we who are followers of Jesus have learned that we're not going to put our investment into the Titanic. Yep, the Titanic is sailing right now and it seems to be doing very well, but we also know according to the word of Jesus that the icebergs await and a big rupture will be torn into the fabric of this present age and it will collapse and all who have put their hope here will collapse as well. Again, in the meantime, we know it doesn't seem the case. So at a basic level, Jesus encouraged his followers to believe uh, not that they're going to win the battle over this age using political means or the power uh, that humanity usually thinks that revolutions come by. I mean, Jesus told us that uh, we don't fight the world with the weapons of this world, that we fight the world rather with the weapons of faith. So in the meantime, uh, let me say something about how believers interact with the present world. Uh, we are told in uh, Romans 13 that we are to pay our taxes. We are also told that we are to acknowledge that the people who have been put into political power over us are to be honored, prayed for, and that we do everything that we can to make their lives a blessing. In this present age, which will collapse and come to nothing, our interaction with the power structures of this world is not that Christians are revolutionaries. We are not. We seek to bless wherever we can. That is our sacred duty before God. And so having said that, I'm going to say that as we think about the Christian relationship to the power structures of this world, that there are in fact two extremes. And let me articulate both of them. On the one side are those who would hold something that has become known as dominion theology. And dominion theology basically believes that, you know, that, that, the, that the followers of Jesus will gain ever greater political power in this present age until they gain dominion over the government and the church will have dominion and rulership in this present age. So we will have dominion even now and then having gained that dominion, Christ will return again. Now in the Middle Ages, that kind of a viewpoint of the marrying of the church and the state and the supremacy of the church over the state led to great persecution of unbelievers. Anyone who didn't believe in Christ as Savior and Lord was seen as a heretic. And so there was, of course, in the history in the Middle Ages, a movement of the inquisitor in the church. And the Inquisition is, of course, a black mark on a deeply, deeply um, a fallen from Jesus kind of a church. Political power became everything. And, and we have to wonder how in the world 
did the church, who had the teaching of Jesus to love your enemies, to do good to those who persecute you, to turn the other cheek, to be agents of mercy and to be agents of grace, which is at the heart of the morality that Jesus teaches, how did the church move from that to becoming inquisitors and individuals who tortured their enemies and used every political means necessary to crush all opposition? How did that happen? Well, it happened because the church as it was then simply fell from Christ. It was no longer a Jesus movement, but a political movement. And so I think it's necessary to say that we need to, as believers in Jesus, followers of Christ, reject dominion theology. We need to say, we're not looking to triumph in this age. We recognize that Jesus said that in this age, we will be treated as he was treated. So there will be persecution and we won't win the day. We wait for Christ's return when then Christ demonstrates his dominion. We don't do it on his behalf. Now, having said that, there is another extreme as well. And the other extreme looks something like this. It says, look, uh, all that's ever going to happen to believers is we're going to be a persecuted lot and we're always going to be shoved to the very fringes of society and we're never going to have an impact at all and the world is just going to go to hell in a handbasket and we're going to you know, gather into these little groups and just hang on until Jesus returns. See, that's an extreme as well and I'll explain why. Uh, just after Jesus teaches the, the Beatitudes, he goes on to say that you're the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth and we need to put that in context. In the ancient world, salt was not thought of something to just give flavor uh, to your meat. It was thought of as a preservative. So in a world that didn't have refrigeration, so you would store meat in salt to keep it. When Jesus said that you are the salt of the earth, he meant to say that the world would become a lot worse were it not for the influence of his followers in a world that's rotten, in a world that's turning from God. That is, the influence of believers, as Jesus taught it, would have a very positive impact into this world. So uh, I think we need to say that kind of a thing. So the impact of Christianity on the, on the world has been good. I'll give you a number of examples. In the early church, there was a practice in the Roman world of the abandonment of unwanted children and even on abortion. And uh, Christian ministry uh, brought an end to the abandonment of, of, of children and of placing a great value on human life, a value that had never been there in the Roman world. And so the influence of the Christian uh, church in, in uh, bringing grace and healing and all manner of good things into the lives of the culture as a whole is well documented. Uh, Christianity was the primary force in the Western world of bringing an end to slavery. Studies have also been done to, to show how the Christian church has transformed attitudes regarding the poor, attitudes regarding the necessity of universal literacy, Christian impact into the arts and the sciences. I mean, I could go on and on and to simply say that indeed the followers of Jesus have been salt and light in a world that's turning away from God. So I'm gonna say that there is indeed a transformative power that comes when there are enough believers of Jesus in any given society. It should change that society for the good, even while we're not looking to gain political power and authority over those who do not believe. So somehow we've gotta guard ourselves against two extremes. One is the desire for political power, and the other extreme is to say, well, if we don't get political power, we're never gonna be an influence. Both of those propositions are fundamentally untrue. So what did Jesus mean when he said, you know, that we're gonna be blessed when we're persecuted for righteousness sake? Well, the answer to that has to do with the fact that Jesus always assumed that there would be an uneasy relationship between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this earth. So let me give you an example of that. I'm reading from Acts 14, 21 and 22, and it comes at the end of Paul's first missionary journey. And then he sums up all of their experience up till now. And here's what the text has to say. It says, when they had preached the gospel, 
to that city and made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the soul of the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. In other words, they assumed that simply being involved in winning people to Christ and influencing society with the, with the message of the gospel, that this would mean that the followers of Jesus would be having to pay a price. There is always a price to pay for advancing the gospel. Paul said it in Philippians 1.29. It says, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you would not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And as a matter of fact, there are a number of other scripture passages that speak just that way. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Just before his execution by Roman authorities, Paul would write these words. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, he says, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. Paul never thought that the world that we live in would ultimately be a friend to grace. It will always be an ongoing warfare. Furthermore, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 14, uh, Apostle uh, Peter's teaching in the early church, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share in the sufferings of Christ, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted, he writes, for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Sounds just like Jesus' teaching, right? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So suffering includes not just being hauled off into prison. I mean, according to Peter, it also includes being insulted for Christ's name. So we have to believe that simply living for Christ will invite vile comments in response. Now, when I say that, I want to be very careful here that we don't imagine to ourselves that when someone criticizes a Christian, they're fulfilling these words. See, I have to acknowledge this truth. Sometimes Christians are criticized for good reason. Um, When in the uh, pre-Civil War era, the Southern Baptist Convention in the United States argued for slavery, There's every reason in the world to criticize the leadership as being false teachers. There's every reason in the world to do that. Or think about it today. I mean, once in a while you'll you'll hear of, you know, televangelists that live these obscene lifestyles, demanding to have their own private jets and demanding that the gospel make them obscenely wealthy. When they're being criticized, they're not being insulted because of Christ. They're being insulted because they claim affinity to Christ, but live lives in direct contradiction to the teachings of Christ. And when people point that out, when they point out hypocrisy in Christians' lives, this is not being persecuted for Christ. It is being persecuted because you're so unlike Christ. I hope we understand that. You see, listen, however, also understand that when we begin to live as Christ wants us to live, when we live consistently with his teaching, when we do the things he demands that we do, and when we bend the knee to Christ and make him Lord and deny the lordship of our culture and make Christ Lord, that action in itself will bring upon itself a response. Now, that doesn't mean it's always imprisonment and death. It's not. I mean, you might think about Hebrews chapter 12, 3 and 4. Uh, The writer of Hebrews says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you, he's saying to believers, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. Now, see, it's a struggle against sin. You've not resisted yet to the point of shedding your own blood. So, I mean, the writer is writing to a group of people here. They're saying, look, I mean, you, you have lived for Christ. There's an intense pressure against you, but you haven't been put into prison and you haven't been, uh, been martyred, at least not at that point in time. However, hostility comes in a number of different forms. But we need to recognize that the world in which we live will never be a friend to grace. Now, in the book of Revelation, 
uh, there is an image that's given to us, and it's the image of the whore of Babylon or the prostitute of Babylon. Uh, Babylon in the book of Revelation uh, is uh, that vile world culture which militates against Christ. You know, in Revelation 17, 2, the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with the whore of Babylon, and consequently, the whole world has become drunk with her intoxicating wine. Uh, she is the woman who leads the whole world astray in terms of immorality of every kind, including sexual immorality. Revelation 16, 17, verse 6 says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. In other words, there is something about the love of darkness that leads to a hatred of Christ. So that the, the kingdoms of the world have a hatred of God and they abuse power and they use their power to try to bring about the end of the followers of Jesus. So we know that persecution is bound to happen. But it doesn't always, as I've said, happen in terms of laws against us. Sometimes it simply happens as a result of people mocking uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And other times, as we're seeing in our day, when we insist on, for instance, sexual purity among believers, um, we, have, we have sometimes a horrible example of well-known Christian leaders actually being involved in sexual immorality, and that brings mocking. And as I've said before, uh, we can't claim persecution there. But at times when we consistently hold the value of sexual morality with a cr Christian perspective, we are sometimes accused of hatred of the human race. And we have to simply recognize that if Christ calls us to be sexually pure, and if we are called haters because of it, we will cling to Christ and recognize that we are being persecuted for righteousness' sake. So, so we make a distinction here, and I hope you're seeing where I'm going with that. So when, when non-Christians may mock us, or when they shake their heads, or when they do something else of that nature, uh, they may simply be fulfilling what Jesus has already said. So notice the language that you have in verses 11, 12 of the text that we've read. You know, for the first time in the Beatitudes, we move from the third person to the second person. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus starts with, but now he says, blessed are you when you are being persecuted. So he's speaking directly to his followers. People are going to abuse you. They're going to insult you. They're going to belittle you. They're going to mock you. They're going to utter all sorts of evil against you falsely. And that's called slander. Now, in the ancient world, I made a list of five slanderous comments that were made against early Christians. And here they are. Number one, Early Christians were accused of having orgies. Number two, early Christians were accused of cannibalism. Number three, early Christians were accused of promoting atheism. Number four, early Christians were accused of stimulating anarchy. And number five, early Christians were accused of being anti-intellectually stupid bumpkins. Let me take each one in turn. Why were Christians accused of orgies? Well, the answer is because they had what were called love feasts in which they'd meet together, sing hymns of worship, and express love for Christ and love for the fellow believers. It was called a love feast, but when non-believers heard they had love feasts, they assumed it must mean they're having orgies. And so a rumor, a slanderous rumor, began to be permeated among non-believers that this is what happens when Christian churches meet together. Second rumor, Christians are involved in cannibalism. Well, you know that Christians talked about feeding on the body of Christ and drinking his blood. We're talking about the elements of communion. Jesus said, this bread is my body, this cup is my blood. So when you heard about the communion service, some non-Christians said, these guys are cannibals. The third thing, atheism. Well, the reason why Christians were charged with atheism, and by the way, you may not know this, but sometimes when Christians were thrown into the lions in the games, the crowd would shout, away with the atheists. And the reason they did that is because Christians said there is but one God. And therefore, all the gods that were commonly worshipped in the ancient Roman world, Christians were saying, they're not gods at all. 
There is but one God. To that came the response, so you're denying the gods, you're atheists. And then, of course, anarchy is simply because in the ancient world, um, if you belong to a trade guild or something of that nature, you were required to pour out libations to Caesar. Uh, and when you did that, you expressed your loyalty to Caesar and to the empire, and you would say, Caesar is Lord. Now, Christians couldn't do that. They said, look, we can't do that. We'll be loyal to Caesar, but we won't proclaim that Caesar is God. There is but one God and Savior, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, and we will only worship him as Lord. He alone is Lord. Caesar is not Lord. And the response to that is, these guys are leading anarchy. And then the final is that, you know, because Christians had won so many slaves and so many of the poor to faith in Christ, they were charged with only being of interest among the lowest of society. Well, see, we we can think about how Christians were slandered in the ancient world, and you might think how Christians are slandered today. We have a hatred of homosexuality, it's sometimes said. Uh, We have a hatred of individuals who have different religious beliefs, it's sometimes said. In other words, Christians are often being accused of spawning hatred. It's a slanderous accusation against the true faith. You see, Christians believe that Christ has taught us how to live and that there is but one truth, but he has also taught us to love our enemies and to do good to those who stand in opposition to us. It is our duty that if there were those who would stand in opposition to us and who are themselves suffering, that we should do the right thing and stand in the way and look to actually bring healing and good to those with whom we disagree. We should be known as the people of love. Now, that's not to say that when we are the people of love, we won't still be slandered. We will be slandered. Christ said that, but that will not change our attitudes to the words that Christ has taught us. We will love our enemies. We will do good to those who persecute us. We will be salt and light in this world, regardless of the response. And yet Jesus said, when all of that happens, when you're faithful to me and to my teaching, when you preach the gospel and win men and women to Christ, when you are then persecuted as a result of that, rejoice and be glad, because you've proved yourself to be in union with me. I love what Dan Doriani said. And let me quote to you what he said. He says, the world blesses the rich, Jesus blesses the poor. The world blesses the carefree, Jesus blesses those who mourn over evil. The world blesses the assertive and the aggressive, Jesus blesses the meek and the gentle. The world blesses those who get what they want, Jesus blesses those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. The world prizes the trouble free, Jesus tells his disciples to rejoice in persecution. See, here's the thing. Jesus has called us to a lifestyle that is radically different than the lifestyle that is well accepted in our culture. We are called to be the unique people who wait for the kingdom that is yet to be revealed. Throw all your eggs into the basket of Jesus, and even if it costs you everything that you have, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. The point behind all of that is simple. Jesus blesses us when we suffer because of him. It is, in fact, an honor to take our place alongside the prophets and the righteous people who are mistreated for righteousness. It's a great blessing to be identified with Jesus in such a way that we are being treated as he was treated. See, that's what Jesus tells us. And I want to say to you today, if you're a follower of Jesus, and being a follower of Jesus has introduced you into a world of hardship, don't say to yourself, woe is me. Rather say to yourself, I am in the most favored position imaginable because the world is treating me in the same way as they treated my Savior, and therefore I know that I am in union with him. His future and my future are one and the same. Rejoice and be glad, for in a very short while now, The kingdom of heaven will be revealed, and Christ will triumph over all. And all those who place their hope in this world will found that they actually put all of their bet on the sinking Titanic. Don't do that. Place all your hope in Christ 
and in His kingdom. Hey, thanks for joining me today and in this short study that we've had of the Beatitudes of Jesus. I hope you've seen how life-altering these blessed statements of Jesus actually are. Reacquaint yourself with those who are truly in the most favored position imaginable. And say to yourself, if you're a follower of Jesus, I could just almost pinch myself and say, man, have I ever been blessed. Hey, may the Lord be with you today. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. And I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.